careful what you wish for, punk. No! Uh-uh! Nope! Nope! I am a reasonable, sane human being. 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world. I'm not Clint Eastwood. I'm Bruce Nolan. Bruce Nolan. That's Jim Carrey from the movie Bruce Almighty talking about his problems with separation. It's a topic we talk quite a bit about with today's guest, UFO researcher Grant Cameron. We go back to the fact that there is just experience. That's all there is. If you take a look at, we talk about the, the evil alien. Okay, so we say there's evil aliens. That's the general impression. And, and if you go and you do the free survey, you see that 84% of all experiencers say if they were given the chance to have it stopped, they would say no. Only 9% say it's evil. And 9% is not zero, but it's getting pretty close. There are no victims. There are just volunteers. It's all experience. So I appreciate the distinctions you're distinctions? making. I, ju- I mean, you're, you're saying at some point we have to move to something else. So what are we moving towards? Here's the kicker and the important part. For, for people who don't believe, like so many of the academics, they're humanist, materialist, atheist paradigm, and they don't have to deal with any of this shit. But for people like you and I who acknowledge an extended consciousness realm, when somebody tells me, yeah, I'm, I'm abusing these kids, and let me tell you, this spirit being, this entity in the extended consciousness realm, and he's really into it too, and he's bringing all this power into the group, and he's doing these physical things, and if I do this ritual in a certain way, it brings even more power into me, and that's my download, he says. That's my experience. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today we welcome back to Skeptico, Grant Cameron. Grant is without question one of the top UFO researchers in the world. He's well known for his website, White House UFOs, where way back in the day he explored the connection between United States presidents and UFOs. But in more recent years, he's been tracking down the connection between the UFO phenomenon and consciousness. Of course, a topic that we are so, so interested in on this show. Well, Grant is also, as many of you know, the author of several terrific books. I'm showing some of them up on the screen. And from what I understand, Grant even has a couple other books in the works that are especially relevant to the topics we're going to be talking about today. I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Grant, it's so awesome to always talk to you. It's just amazing the new information you bring forward. And I'm looking forward to this one because, you know, I kind of teed this up. I had an interview with Dolan a while back and you were a part of our discussion. And I wanted to kind of thread this into uh, an ongoing, just level three kind of discussion. So it's really cool to have you here. Well, it's an honor to be on, Alex, because um, in the way that I have done consciousness over the last eight years, you too have gone down that road when it really wasn't all that popular. It's now become sort of like a buzzword, Uh, but you were there at the beginning and you've taken the same sort of interest in the consciousness aspect to reality as I have. So I'm I'm honored to be talking to you. Well, you know, what's kind of cool is that we kind of came at it from two separate angles that kind of intersect. And... I have to say, you are really one of the people that pulled me into the UFO world uh, deeper than I was Willing going go. on my own. You know what I mean? So yeah. I was down the consciousness path and I was exploring near-death experience. At first, I was, I was exploring, anyone who's listening to the show knows this, but if they're just popping in, you know, I was down the par- parapsychology path, the really, let's like look at science, is precognition real, you know, because all these materialist skeptics deniers want to say it isn't and then that led me to near-death experience that led me to extended consciousness medium communication and all the rest of this stuff and then grant cameron pops along and says hey wait a minute i'm seeing all these connections between this ufo phenomenon we're talking about and the et contact experience and consciousness and we talked about that quite extensively 
in my interview with uh, Richard Dolan. Okay. And we went over that whole history. And he, along with me, identifies you as one of the key people in making that startling connection between the Wilbert Smith memo. And I won't go over that whole thing with people because we did a whole show on it and you've talked about it many times, but the connection between that and consciousness. So if you want, you know what we could do here? I mean, I don't know where to really start this, but let's start it with you updating us on what's going on in your world and then I'm going to jump into that Dolan interview in a rather okay. lengthy clip, and we can pick up on that conversation. But Grant, I just got you on the phone. How are you doing? What's, what's going on in, in your world? You got a lot of stuff going on as usual. Tell us what's up. Lots of stuff is going on. It's the most active period of my life. As, as we were talking about with the consciousness thing, it starts with the consciousness download that I get in 2012. And it's sort of like people who maybe have had a, a near-death experience. I didn't choose to have it. It happened. It flipped me into this world. I wasn't intending to go there. And then in about uh, 2017, I had a more dramatic, lengthy, sort of noetic experience where I was given about 24 different things about how the universe worked. And it's been sort of high-end excitement since then. The books I'm working on now sort of try to tie everything together. So it starts with this consciousness aspect where I'm told this has all got to do with consciousness and now the books I'm working on more tied together all the stuff you're talking about at the beginning near-death experiences you know mediums I'm big into physical mediums now and I tie all these elements together so I'm doing a book called contact modalities which should be out uh, momentarily and it basically uh, looks at all the different modalities and the, the concept is that everything is in the field all the information is in the field and Various people through the ability to shut down the noise in their brain and whether that's mediums or uh, people who are having out, out of body experiences or near death experiences or people who have brain hemorrhages or brain injuries that they're able to pop in the field and grab the material. So I've got about 70 different contact modalities and I put them all together. The other thing I'm working on, I'm, I'm working on a book called Extraterrestrial or Maybe Not. And in there I look at, I've, I've gone the Jacques Vallée route where Jacques Vallée's always said, I'd be very surprised if this turns out to be extraterrestrials. Uh, I'm going down the same road now where I say it's basically all tied together. So what I've been doing just in the last month is I'm tying together experiences that happen in the spirit world, that happen in physical mediumship and in the UFO, and they're absolutely identical. And I'll give you two examples. I, I have an, an interview that's up on my Facebook play, page right now or on my White House UFO YouTube channel with a guy by the name of Ron Johnson, who's a, a guy, he's a Mormon guy out of um, Salt Lake City area, who has this, these experiences starting in the 1960s. And as part of his UFO experiences, he has three dozen out-of-body experiences, where he believes that the beings actually take him out. And in three of those occasions, they take him to the spirit world. He goes into the spirit world, and he's interacting with his mother in the spirit world. And she takes him to a building in the spirit world, and she says, Ron, when you die, because he's got very advanced heart disease, when you die, when you come here, you're going to get a, a room in this building. So he says, I go into the building, and he says, I'm surprised. It's way bigger on the inside of the building than it is on the outside of the building. And as soon as he said that, I said, that's UFO stuff. Chris Bledsoe, who's now sort of becoming a very famous experiencer in the UFO world, at one point told me that he had flown the craft, and you, you fly the craft with your mind. It's done telepathically you become one with the craft the craft is alive and during that interview I said tell me I want you to start from the beginning go to the end and I want you to tell me how do you fly a craft so he starts and he says well the object is on the ground it's shaped like an egg it has this sort of a, a doorway I go in and he says I suddenly realize it's way bigger on the inside of the craft than it is on the outside and he goes in but looks back out and it's small he looks inside and it's way bigger it's identical story and it's not kind of a story you're going to make up if you're gonna to try to make something up. The other story, and to give you an example, Ron Johnson tells me when he's in this, in this building with his mother in the spirit world, she takes him and she shows him this table with crystals on it. And she tells him the story that all these crystals are the, the stories of people's lives. And so you look into the crystal at a certain angle and you can see your entire life 3D back as far as you wanna go. 
and he takes a look at his dog's crystal. The, his, the crystal of his dog comes up and he looks at his dog and he sees how his dog died. He didn't know how the dog died and he realized that it had been shot by the neighbor. So he, and he said, my crystal doesn't come up until I'm in, in the spirit world. So he's telling this story. Okay, now we go back and we look at a 1988 documentary, UFO documentary called UFO Cover Up Live, which is always rumored to be a, a documentary where the CIA was dropping stuff into the UFO community. It's done in the final days of the Reagan administration. And during that documentary, they talk, Richard Doty, who's the Falcon, who's now becoming sort of famous, this Richard Doty guy says, the most amazing thing I saw of all the evidence I saw was a, a, an octagonal crystal that the aliens held. And they held this crystal up and you looked at it at a certain angle and you could see the entire history of the whole world. And the rumor back in the 1980s, when this story was going around, is that they had actually shown the US government the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in this crystal. It's the same story. You go to Michael Newton. Michael Newton says, in the spirit world, you're in the life between lives. People are looking at the books. He says, you open up the book and there's a crystal in it. And you look at a certain angle at the crystal and you plan your future lives. You can see your past lives. You go all that. So these are the connections I'm starting to make. And there's so many connections where I'm starting to say, I don't really know if this is ET. This may be just spirits, higher self, whatever, who are putting on a different mask because now we're in the now we're in the space age and if you take a look you have and i'm doing people with light language now these people who can speak these weird light languages and people who can speak 20 of them it only hasn't happened for 10 the last 10 years no more than that i go and people are dealing with reptilians i say what was the first reptilian experience 1988 when was the first gray experience 1961 with betty and barney hill and they were wearing hats and you see these bizarre things and you're going like maybe this isn't alien at all maybe this is just because we're in the space age they've come in and portrayed themselves as aliens. And it's because it's basically the same message that you're gonna get in near-death experiences, in people who are claiming they're talking to soul guides, who are talking to their higher self, people who are channeling. It's the same message coming through all these different entities. Okay, uh, excellent way to tee it up. And I'm tempted, so tempted to jump in there on like a million different points. Sure. But I'm gonna hold on for a minute. I wanna play the Dolan clip and then then we'll pick up the conversation because i have okay. a couple of interesting little paths to take us down sure and i'm with grant in the sense that and i'm with chris bledsoe in the sense that i don't think that it's all negative but i'm not with i don't know i don't know where grant stands on this actually but i wouldn't be with him if he were to say it's all positive like, I don't believe that. I mean, Stephen Greer would say it's all positive too, and I strongly disagree with that. I think that's just foolish. So I think you that know that's almost to me the third dimension of it because I want to recap what you talked about, which I find so intriguing. The first uh, dimension isn't the proper word, forgive me, but the first question that pops to mind is, what is the interface with our physical reality? You know, because we're interested in that. We we have this kind of curious engineering mind. How did he make the lights shift like right, that? Right, exactly. <laughs> and the second, I think, right. question that pops up is, what is the technology of the consciousness interface? And I think that's particularly interesting because when we look at ET and we start looking at the cases, there's clearly, as Grant pointed out in that clip we played, from the 1950s, we understood there's mental telepathy as the means of communication. And we go, well, shit, we don't know how to do that. But apparently they do, and they have it like a, an app on their iPhone. So there's a technology component to consciousness that we just totally don't get. And it also relates to this time-space thing that we don't get. But then the third dimension of it, which you just, just touched on, and I think is so fascinating, and I really want to get to it because it gets to the heart of the video that you did with Tracy, yeah. hmm. and that's the good versus evil, the moral yeah. imperative. It's so challenging because we've all gone through, you know, you said you went through an atheistic phase. Any thinking person doesn't go through an atheistic phase because most of us are fed with this kind of narrow Christian uh, dogma, of, mm -hmm. you know, get on the ark kind of stuff. But when we blast past that, we're still faced with, is there good and bad? And how does that work? You talked about Grant. Let me play what Grant has to say about that. And then I want to get your take and then I'll offer my take on it. 
there's good and bad. There is a moral difference. You know, take the most extreme example, the guy who's taking little kids and cutting them up and selling their body parts and sexually molesting them. That, in my mind, is is bad. It's evil. And then there, where there's a bunch of shades in between, and then there are some really holy good people that I don't know how they do it, but they keep all their shit together and they really do it. That, how's your universe? Is, is there good and bad? Because some people in the consciousness camp say, well, there's really no good and bad. It all just kind of, you know. Well, if you go to the new and stuff, no. If you get into reincarnation, it's all experience. If you, because what the mistake you make is you, you, you did it in that sentence. You say, okay, there's these guys who cut up little people or whatever. Okay, and then there's these good people who basically have it all together. And I would go to, don't have to quote the Bible, but we, with the whole thing with the prostitute, Jesus said, Lead, he who is perfect cast the first stone. All you have, you do not have good people and bad people. You do not have good aliens and good bad aliens. Jesus. Okay, that was all, did you, you heard all that, right? Sure, yeah, I heard Okay, it. so. What uh, do you want to hear first? Long, long clip. It shoehorns us right into an ongoing kind of discussion. You pick it up wherever you want. Okay, I guess the good, the good evil thing. I have not changed my position. This is this is like a religious uh, dogma: good versus evil. Uh, it's a scientific religious uh, superstition that there's there's positive, negative. Basically, we go back to the fact that there is just experience. That's all there is. If you take a look at, we talk about the, the evil alien. Okay, so we say there's evil aliens, that's the general impression. And, and if you go and you do the free survey, you see that 84% of all experiencers say, if they were given the chance to have it stopped, they would say no. Only 9% say it's evil. And 9% is not zero, but it's getting pretty close. And when Ray Hernandez went back and interviewed those 9%, basically the vast majority of them said, why, why, why do you think they're evil? And they said, because they scared the living daylights out of me. They were tall, eight foot tall reptilians in their bedroom or whatever. And that was being raised, that's it. That's basically why you're calling them evil. And they said, yeah, that's basically it. They're in, in, the, in the real world, in, in I, I say the, world, the way the world works is the universe is neutral. And if we get these dogmas, we get these belief systems about good and bad and separation. There is only one thing. It is all one thing. And we move into duality. We create these little worlds where we're the good guy and then there's bad guys. And you can take a look at the little children, the, the pedophile thing. So I would say to you, okay, you and I, I was in, I'm in Canada, you're in the United States. In World War II, we thought we were saving the world. And we went to Germany and we were fighting Hitler and we'd invented this technique in 1942 where we started the, these fire bombings where we created this this firestorm where we cremated 25,000 people in one night now if you say pedophilia is 10 out of 10 where does dropping in a bomb and, and cremating 25,000 people alive go where does dropping two atomic bombs it's all 10 out of 10 I will agree there are things that are, that are that are, are good things that are bad but in the end, if you take a look, Google uh, near-death experience and a Google oneness, and a video will pop up of a woman who will talk about the fact that she had a vision. So she has this uh, near-death experience. And you can say, okay, she had this near-death experience, and we believe all this. And then she starts talking about the vision she had. There are no victims. There are only volunteers. I have got a number of people who have told me identical stories uh, having near-death experiences. There are no victims. There are just volunteers. It's all experience. The idea... We have to kind of step back because if consciousness is primary, if consciousness is fundamental, like you and I both believe that it yeah. is, and the best science keeps coming back and saying, gee, every time we run the double slit experiment, every yeah. time we run all... It's consciousness is fundamental. Okay. You know? So then this whole discussion is kind of moot to a certain point because it's all just droplets in the ocean and that we're identifying as waves or foam or currents or all yep. these things. It's just the ocean. But at some point we have to, we have discernment. We have to start making these distinctions. So I appreciate the distinctions you're distinctions? making. I just, what we have to, like, what was, like, I mean, you're, you're saying at some point we have to move to something else. So what are we moving towards? Well, I, I didn't mean it that way, if that word threw you off in terms of distinctions. I, I'm, I'm talking about what you're saying, the conclusions that you're making are some distinctions within the ocean, right? Because if it's an ocean of consciousness, there's really nothing to talk about. That's right. It all is one. 
but we are interested as human beings and as people who are trying to figure out what is the right thing to do with our lives and our time and our energy. We're making distinctions and reading, interpreting stories a particular way. So I'm going to challenge you on a couple of things that you said, because we're, you know, there's few people who I feel have such a, a deep grasp of this thing like you do. So it's super great opportunity. Yeah. And I don't want people to think I'm like getting in your face here, but Go it's ahead. a skeptical kind of thing. I'm changing it. So here are, the, here are the problems I have with it. One is I kind of feel sometimes like you're kind of jumping on the data one way when the data really, as I read, it comes back the other way. I like how you reference Michael Newton. And then are you familiar with Rich Martini? Who wrote oh, absolutely. Book? Sure. Okay. So Rich Martini, uh, since Michael Newton has passed on, he's the between lives researcher. And Martini actually got to interview him for this movie that he did, Flipside. And he has since interviewed many, many people who have both facilitated these between live regressions and have participated in them. And I don't take every one of those stories as gospel because you can't. You know that. You know, you have Why not? To just... Well, why not? I mean, he... well, How... well, let me finish, Grant. Yeah, because here's the point that you're just completely glossing over. You're suggesting that that research suggests that there's no judgment. The 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 Martini documents in his film with experiencers that it's just the opposite. They definitely felt a high, like I like to call it a hierarchy of consciousness, a moral imperative, good and bad. You know, one of the most for anyone who's watched that film, one of the most compelling scenes is a woman who is being led, goes back to a past life memory of her being in the Nazi concentration camps yeah. and being led to the gas chamber. And she thinks about resisting. And then she says, no, I'm with my people. This is the path that I have to play. This is the role that I have to play in this. But at the same time, she feels the weight and burden that her perpetrators will have to carry in working out the deeds that they're doing. Embedded in all that, Grant, is a judgment, is a moral imperative, is a good, is a bad, is a this is the thing to do, this is not the thing to do, is that my actions matter. That is central to the near-death experience. If you look at it, you know, Jeff Long, you know Jeff Long, he's now trying to help you guys in the free organization clearly, and you know from my interviews, I've talked to him, overwhelmingly, the message is that there is a moral imperative, there is good, there is bad, there is a hierarchy, there are choices. It's not judgmental in the old-fashioned Bible, Christian, thumper, dogmatic, I decide who goes to hell thing. It's more your soul's journey in deciding what is discernment again, deciding what is the path, what is the good thing. But this idea of this, there's no good, there's no evil, it's all just kind of a blob of consciousness, completely flies in the face of the between lives data and the near-death experience data, as well as the after-death communication data. You know, and I have good research on that, but it comes back over and over again that there's good things to do and there's bad things to do and there's consequences and the consequences are your own consequences in terms of what that, how you will judge that later on. Okay. The way I see Mike Newton and I've studied Newton as much as anybody is that when you have the life review, it is you basically reviewing your own life and that everybody is asked only one question. How did it work out? Because you set up the play. You set up the volunteered for this. You volunteered for that. We did this. We did that. And everybody says the same five word answer. I could have done better. I forgot to do this. I was going to do that. And so when you when you when you get down to the whole thing, my definition of evil and there, there is evil. My definition of evil is all that we consider to be evil in the modern world is the mistaken belief in separation. Once you believe that you are separate, then things become objects. We can do whatever we want, and we, we do these things. And when we have the judgment thing, we realize, oh, we should have done that, should have done this. And I say that in the end, we're judging people say whatever whatever we have we have an, a problem with this person and in the end I, I simply believe according to newton that you if you do not understand this person's position 
you're going to come back in that position to have empathy and understanding. We can go to, if you want to do scientific evidence, we go to Jill Bolte Taylor, PhD, neuroanatomist, no stupid woman who has the left brain hemorrhage. And she says that all of the idea of separation comes from a little area the size of a peanut in your left brain. And she said when those, when those, ner those neurons go offline, as hers did when it was flooded with blood, she suddenly realized, I am not separate. The I am not, uh, there is no ego, there is no I. I am one with the universe. And the idea that you are separate from everybody else in the universe is an illusion. And she says it quite clearly, if you listen to her, her interviews and her TED Talks, that it's just an illusion that you think. It's like you think the world is flat. You think the world is coming around. The more evidence you get, the more you realize that it's all, it's all one thing. And when you believe you're separate, that I'm better than this person, I can use them. I can use objects. I can chop down the last tree, get the last fish out of the ocean. It really doesn't matter. They're just objects. I'm separate from them. Once you believe that, that you are one, then you become like the Italians standing on, the, on their, their deck with their little cell phones, all singing as one, that we have to realize that we are one, we are all together. And, and if we do not realize that we, are, that we are one and that we are separate and we're gonna have me versus you, good versus bad, we're gonna destroy the world. It's all over except for the screaming and crying as far as I'm concerned. Okay, I have to say, Grant, you've, you've really been a key part <laughs> of, of uh, this ongoing dialogue that I've been generating, these series of shows that I've been generating on the nature of evil. And your voice inside my head has been ongoing because I agree, you know, philosophically and spiritually with so many of the things that you're saying, but I, I just think you're making some distinctions a little bit differently, well, quite a bit differently than I would make. And it relates again to this ocean of consciousness that then becomes a blob of consciousness. Here's where I'm coming from. And let's see if I can corral you into this ongoing discussion I've had. Extended consciousness is something that you and I are both comfortable with. We're comfortable with the notion. You're referring to contact modalities. I would kind of almost merge that with my, I, what I'm calling extended consciousness. So the shamanic journey guy goes and licks the toad and has a DMT experience, he's in extended consciousness. The ET experiencer is on board a ship, but as you can see his body down there, he's in extended consciousness. Near-death experiencers, same thing, you know, well, extended consciousness again, and I think you're calling that contact modalities. Here's a point that I think is interesting that I haven't heard a lot of people explore. And that is my contention that evil is a lens through which we can explore extended consciousness in a very real way. So I just popped up on the screen some of the people I've been interviewing about this evil. And I do it not because I'm particularly interested in evil or I'm particularly interested in satanic ritual abuse, which is one of the topics that I cover. But take satanic ritual abuse, really interesting topic. Okay. And I can bring back some of the people that I had up on the screen there. But Annika Lucas is interesting because she's six years old when her mother sells her into slavery with a cult that turns out to be, in Belgium this is, unfortunately, turns out to be a satanic cult that not only sexually abuses, rapes these kids, but then murders them. And this is reported over and over again. So I have various other interviews with a bunch of people that confirm this. And there's studies that confirm this. And there's a, a Brown University scholar who's done research on it. And I have up on the screen, Bob Hammer, who's 20 years FBI undercover agent who went in and infiltrated Mambla, who is organized, a pedophile ring that's organizing these expeditions where these 50 year old men can rape these young boys. The reason I go into all that is two points. One is with anyone's sensibility, anyone you'll talk to, yep. they say that is, that is evil in just kind of the way that I would understand evil. But and here's the kicker. Here's the kicker and the important part that everyone, in my opinion, seems to be looking past. In the case of satanic ritual abuse, these folks are actively seeking connection with 
the extended consciousness realms and beings in those extended consciousness realms in order to further carry out the deeds. Now, is that connection, what they're getting out of that connection? We can only listen to what they say. But the fact, see, for, for people who don't believe, you know, like so many of the academics, you know, like, well, shit, it doesn't matter what people believe about the extended consciousness realm because the extended consciousness realm doesn't exist. So it's all just crazy belief system. It's why people believe weird things because they're locked in to their materialist paradigm, their humanist, materialist, atheist paradigm, and they don't have to deal with any of this shit. But for people like you and I who acknowledge an extended consciousness realm, when somebody tells me, yeah, I'm, I'm abusing these kids, and let me tell you, this spirit being, this entity in the extended consciousness realm, and he's really into it too, and he's bringing all this power into the group, and he's doing these physical things, and if I do this ritual in a certain way, it brings even more power to me, into me, and that's my download, he says. That's my experience. It's not just about me in this realm. It's about me connecting with that extended realm. That is the lens, Grant, that I would suggest catapults this into a whole different way that we have to look at it and understand it. And let me jump in there with one more really important point. I have no idea how it works. I don't understand the mind of God. I don't have a map of extended consciousness realms to be able to say, this means this and this means that. But the data does compel me to consider this evil question much more interdimensionally than I think most people are looking at it. Okay, you, you said a lot of stuff. I mean, when it comes to extended human consciousness, I would maybe see it a little bit different. It's all consciousness. There's no us and then extended consciousness. It's all just consciousness. And it's the ability to get into the consciousness by shutting down the left brain, shutting down the rational analytical brain. So it's but all hold on, consciousness. Hold on, hold on one minute. I don't, I don't want to interrupt you too much, but see, th this is part of the discussion that, that hey, I, I'm with you. We can go okay. to sea of consciousness okay. and then we can just shut down and have the discussion. But you just talked about 40 contact modalities that, that implicit in that is this idea that there is this extended consciousness realm that we connect to in different ways. I'm just ways. defining so how I see it, that it's all consciousness and that we use, we shut down the left rational analytical brain and we can pop in through these different modalities. So you get into the, to the, to this whole thing and the, the, the expression that, that I've heard is, if your higher self, if you believe that there's a devil and there's Satan, your higher self will come as the devil. Because if it comes as anything else, you're not going to. So whatever it is you want to manifest in your little consciousness realm, you can manifest. You can manifest good. You can manifest evil. There's an experiment that was done in the 1970s in Toronto. It's called a Philip experiment where they create the ghost, where they actually create a ghost. And they make up this story about this ghost from the 16th century. And then they start doing the meditation thing and they can't get it to work. And then they start going into seance thing and they actually produce this ghost that actually responds and levitates tables and all, does all this sort of stuff. So what I would say is that everything that you do, you're manifesting. And as much as we can build a building in the spiritual world and that anything that is negative there, we have manifested, we have created because it's just us. There is just us one there is just me there is not me and then extended consciousness it's just me and i manifest and we have built these worlds so if you commit suicide you're going to leave a very negative uh, uh, energy and my question to you is be do you think that all these people who do these very evil things at five years old have decided i think i'm going to grow up and i'm going to be a pedophile and i'm going to molest little children and kill them and stuff like that people don't it's the same as when i went to a homeless shelter i work in a homeless shelter and they said take a look these people did not decide to be here and homeless. And I think you're just setting yourself up that you could go to the world and you say, Alex, after your, your thing, you had a real problem with these pedophiles. Maybe what you should do, we're gonna send you back to be one of these pedophiles so you can have understanding and, and, and ex understand why these people went down this road. Because people go down all sorts of roads, homelessness, alcohol, all sorts of things, and nobody intends to do it, it just happens. Well, you're just you're saying things that kind of contradict each other. No. I mean, well, yeah, you are, because it's like on one hand, you're saying that, you know, none of these experiences really matter because we manifest them all and we can manifest whatever we want. And then you tell stories, which, I, I mean, I, look, I, I, maybe that came out the wrong way as too negative, because this is all impossible, I think, in for us to 
fully understand or even partially understand with right. our limited brain. I, 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 I'm never going to figure this out. I don't know. But like, you know, the story you told early on about the yeah. crystals, and then you felt like there was some kind of confirmation in the 1988 UFO film with Doty in it yeah. and the crystal. And you talked about that thing like it's real, right? Yeah. I, why would, but why do you feel like that's real? And then all this other stuff is just manifestation. You know, I just listened to an interview. I, I interviewed not too long ago, Rob and Trish McGregor, who are two really interesting people, like fantastically successful authors, written like a, a hundred books between them. Rob has written all the books for uh, Lucas with the Star Wars books. Anyways, he just published this interview because in the interview I had with him, he told me about this guy in Texas, Wes Meeks. This guy is a former police officer in Texas, one of the people you kind of trust. He talks about incredible out-of-body experiences, and he talks about physically all the out-of-body things, being out-of-body, seeing things that are going on at a very young age, being able to follow his brother as he went to the bathroom at night and see him turn on the light, and, you know, and then later in life, he has the out-of-body experiences. He travels to the spiritual realm. Yep. He sees the Akashic Records. Now, he sees the Akashic Records different than I've heard anyone else see them different jars and stuff like that. He meets this woman. This woman shaves shifts, and he has this incredible sexual experience with this woman. I mean, so that doesn't immediately, like, throw this thing out the window. But if you listen to the whole account, you're like, well, that doesn't exactly jive with every other account I've heard of the Akashic Records. So you're, you're kind of forced okay. to, no. to go, go, go ahead. No, because what you're doing is you're manifesting. So all the accounts in the spirit world are going to have some variation because you're creating it. It's not like we're here and then there's this spirit world that has this stuff. Two of the contact modalities I do are number one, lucid dreaming. And I do the, the psychedelic stuff with John Hopkins, the psilocybin stuff. And they both say the same thing. They both say that you are creating, you're manifesting in that world and that things are all symbolic. So in the, in the, 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 the thing with uh, done at Stanford with the uh, lucid dream stuff, if you come up against the evil alien or the evil devil, and this is told quite clearly, when you come up against it, if you go and you treat it with unconditional love and you give it a big hug and kiss, it will turn into a positive being and give you a positive message. So it is all manifestation. When we go in, when my friend goes into the spirit world with his mother, that's all manifestation. There is no, there is no physical things. There's no time and space. There's no physical thing. It is all Uli stuff. We are creating it all with our brain. So when you go into the physical world, all the accounts of the Akashic Records, all the accounts are going to have some sort of variation because it's us that are manifesting. Even if you look at the Newton stuff, when people, are, no, hang on, when people are, Newton asks them the question, when you are in the spirit world and you meet somebody, how do you know which body to present to that other person because you've lived a thousand different lives. And he said, it depends upon who I'm talking to. I can screen as images, whatever I want, based upon the life I had with that person. It's all manifestation. It's all Uli stuff. It's all created. There is no out there world. There is no spirit world. It's all us creating this thing through our, our consciousness. We are all one. We come in, we make the separation, and we build this world based out of consciousness. It's not like there's consciousness and then there's the spirit world and there's consciousness and there's a physical world. It's all consciousness. It's all created by consciousness. I, I'm with you to, to a certain extent, to a large extent I am. Except then you're but, saying there's but, a physical, there's a spirit world that has these attributes. No, it's all well, consciousness. Well, but, but you were saying a minute ago about how the planet is doomed unless we get together and start hugging trees or not right. throwing away plastic bottles. This is all manifested reality. Why, why are you, why do you feel so comfortable making these judgments? I've heard you make, I heard you make judgments that the, that the ET is basically more liberal in their politics than conservative. Absolutely. There's, I don't, not, there's, there's not a That's, that's, that's absurd. That's absurd. Okay, give me something, Just, that's, give me something absurd. that's capitalist about an alien. It's yeah, anything absurd. that's capitalist but an alien, nothing. It's me absurd that. to say all the things that you're saying. Well, give about me an example of something that's capitalist about an alien. Well, look, the, the whole, I could pick tons of cases. Uh, Richard Doty, who you cited a minute ago, is 
it's completely entrenched in the in the machine in whatever the game is that's being played in terms of i mean uh, I, you, you got me scrambling because it's just so obvious and apparent the the psyop that's been run and you've talked about in terms of disclosure all those guys are not playing the game that you're that you're talking about they're they're playing the different game they're playing the control game they're playing the the fear game they're playing the disinformation game. The separation game they're in separation they're in us versus them we're military there's bad guys around the world and we need to develop this to create some weapons they're into and, separation and, you, and, there's separation and, you're, and you're against that and you're saying you're against that i'm against separation absolutely i'm into one you're against it then you're in the duality my friend why am i in duality you're in the duality i'll tell you a story i heard that i thought was extremely uh, relevant to this and it's a very touching story it, it, i heard it through that the dalai lama reports that when the evil, horrible communist Chinese came in and overran Tibet. And they did. They took this little country and they just took it over, right, in the 19th As we did to North Vietnam, yeah. Yeah, and then they dragged the monks out in the street and they made them fornicate in the street just to show, hey. As we probably did in Vietnam, yeah. We're, we're atheists and, and, and we want to show you how your beliefs don't hold up to the barrel of a gun. So this one monk went through this horrible experience and imprisonment with the Chinese, the evil Chinese. I'm going to throw that in just to kind of rally up a little bit. Yeah. And right. then in he, separation. Comes, yeah. he comes back and he's recounting his things and he goes, it, it, it was horrible. I, I experienced great, great, great danger. And they said, wow, you, you, you really thought you were going to die at some point. And he said, no, I, I thought at some point I would lose my compassion. I would lose my ability to see that there is no separation. Right. So I would suggest to you that you cannot at the same time oppose this group or oppose this, what you see as capitalistic. Oh or inside, okay. outside, and then say, oh, no, because it's all about consciousness, and it's all about no separation, but I'm not being separate. I just know these No, I, I, are bad. I, I, I go along with it. I say that everybody's going to be the six, six-year-old girl in a cage. Everybody's going to be floating around the Mediterranean learning to drown. Everybody's going to wander the world. We don't get to be the rich guy in, in America every single time. We don't get to be have the good life. Everybody's going to get to play all the different roles. So if you don't Richard know Cody's that, I mean, you don't know day, that. That's fine. You don't, you don't know that. In general, I get what you're saying, but you, the, the data doesn't like exactly conform to what you're saying. The Newton data absolutely conforms. That's what Newton. I, data I already told you how you're misinterpreting the Newton data and the Newton data is all about making good choices so that you can somehow, that there is an active process of transmuting this evil, if you will, that it is our job, our Separate. mission in this soul journey to do better. We they don't do. just, we don't just like you're saying, you know, well, you're going to come back as a pedophile and you're going to experience that. No, when you come back as a pedophile, I would suggest my read of the Newton data is you do what the person who rescued Annika Lucas out of certain murder did. And that's that that person rescued her, rescued that 10-year-old girl who was going to be killed because they had used her to the extent that they didn't want her to escape and reveal their satanic ritual abuse plot. And even though he was a, a perpetrator, he pulled her out of that whore. He paid for it with his life. He was later killed. But he did in that act something that propelled his soul forward. So there is good, there is evil, there is choice, and we make those choices all the time. And to, to diminish that or to not see that is to miss the, the whole point of the thing. The whole point is oneness versus separation, that when you believe in separation, you will do evil. And if you want to get rid of the evil, you have to go to oneness. If you believe that you and I are actually the same person, when I look in your eyes, I'm looking in my own eyes, then how can you do evil? How can I kill you? How can I do whatever? It's the belief in separation that these people are objects, that, that 
whether it's the communist Chinese, whether it's Richard Doty, everybody's into their thing of separation where it's me versus the, the, the people outside the country or I need more stuff. And it's always separation. That is the thing. And all evil I maintain will disappear if you suddenly realize that everything is separate. Everything is a lot. Everything's one. Almost like Joe Bolte Taylor said, I'm one with the universe. There, I'm not an individual. That was an illusion. Once you realize that you're part of the universe, then you become like the Italians where you're sitting there singing and you're trying to survive together and it brings people together. When you believe that you're separate and that I am better than you and uh, I'm special, then that's when evil takes place because we start treating people like, like objects and we, we, we move away. Separation is the basic, the, the mistaken belief in separation. So even though these people may believe in separation, it doesn't exist. Just because people believe separation exists, it doesn't exist. Yeah, we just we just keep repeating ourselves. I, I guess yeah. I'll I'll pull back to to one point to see if we can kind of nail this down, and then we don't have to yeah. just keep hammering on it. But and and I have to again repeat that you know it's kind of funny because this ongoing dialogue, even if it looks like we are arguing a bit, has moved me forward, has propelled me forward because what I think is interesting about the satanic ritual abuse stuff is that it's a clear example where evil is trying to connect with evil in the extended consciousness realm. And I think unless we look at that objectively and say, oh, okay, that seems to be highly suggestive of the idea that we, we have to resolve inside, in my opinion, we have to resolve relative to the near-death experience data and the afterlife, uh, or I'm sorry, and the between lives Michael Newton data. And that is, there seem to be entities that are not actively trying to advance their soul in this kind of time frame that we're in. They're in that other realm, and it's a as below, so above world where we all understand that we can look in this world and see people who choose to do horrible things to each other and to themselves. But now I think we have to face the evidence that somehow or another in this extended realm, which is vast and multi-layered, there seem to be entities that are of that, of that ilk, and we've seen them throughout history, and we don't really understand them. I stand with okay. you in that I don't think that is, the, that is the part of the picture that we need to focus on. And I think we can transcend that. I think we can transmute that. I think we can, we can also okay. actively inc not include it as part of our thing. But I, I kind of hear a little bit of a denial that there is even that, that reality. There is no separation. There are no evil people out there who have uh, that that are separate from the consciousness there may be demons? beings out there are there, there demons? may demons there okay demons so there may be there may be beings out there who like us have believed in separation and, and people will bring up the evil aliens so i say oh, okay evil aliens have, uh, have they dropped an atomic bomb yet i mean if there are these evil aliens out there i mean have they done this have they cremated uh, in this the firestorm of 19 45 over Tokyo where we dropped it on the civilian areas and we cremated 80,000 people in two nights alive civilians have they done anything like this yet so we can say oh there's why these people that, that why do you keep it? bringing that up why do you keep bringing that up as if that's as if that's significant because we're separating ourselves we're saying there's these evil things we're the good guys we're we've done everything we're the we're the light on the I'm hill we're God's that. gift to the I'm world not we're not saying that I'm so I'm not saying nobody's that. Certainly... good enough to go to heaven Nobody's um, bad enough to go to hell. We're all just floating around in between in reincarnation, learning none. Uh, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Judge not that you be not judged. It goes over and over and over. You, there is no separation. There are people who have gotten into the belief of separation. That's where evil comes from. End of story. Yeah, I always like when people say end of story. <laughs> like, that, that, to like, me, it's the bottom line. It, it, okay, to you, it's the bottom line. To me, so you can bring up pedophiles. I'll bring up fire bombings and atomic bombs and the things that we've got. We've got people in Guantanamo Bay, 20 years without trial and without charges. Like we think we've got this thing. Everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it all comes from the belief in separation. When you believe there are terrorists who do not, do not have rights and you, you can treat them as animals and as, as objects. 
No one the thinks belief that. in separation. No one, I you don't, are I don't your enemy. That. Your enemy is you. We are all the same thing. I, I, I don't think that, but I, I don't understand you, how, how you are so, you feel so comfortable making these discernments, these judgments, but when other people make similar kind of judgments, then you, you, you immediately dismiss that, that none of that can possibly be important or meaningful, those judgments, because it's all about this single issue of separation. The separation part, as I explained at the beginning, we are in sync. It, it is an ocean of consciousness, ultimately. That's what the data comes back and says. What we're trying to understand is the nature of all the steps in between that ocean, all the waves, all the foam on the sea, all the deep waters of it. And if you don't want to make those distinctions, then don't make them at all. But I don't see how you can, you know, want to make and hold on to your distinctions about contact modalities and about crystals that review lives, but you're uncomfortable with the distinctions that I'm making that are drawn from a lot of the same data. Part of the download I got is there are no nouns. As soon as you start saying there's this, there's that, there's this, that is scientific religious superstition. That is creating nouns. There is only consciousness. There is one thing. It's all consciousness, and it will all unravel at some point in, in, in the future. Everything's going to move towards the good. Uh, everybody is just lost. Anybody who's doing evil is believing in, in separation. And it, that's, to me, it's the bottom line. It's all consciousness. There, it's a verb. There are no nouns. When you start getting nouns, you, you try to, you know, this person, that person, this thing, that thing. It's all, just, it's all just a sea of consciousness. And we manifest in that sea of consciousness. And we can create good things. We can create bad things. We are creating it all in consciousness. And the, the bad is created by the belief in separation that you and I are separate. Then how is the good created? You know, one of the things- There is no good, there is no bad, there's just consciousness, there's no good and bad, those are nouns. You You keep going to scientific and religious superstitions all the time, you keep going to nouns. There are no nouns, it's just consciousness. Grant, you realize that one minute ago I can replay the tape. They said there's good and then there's bad and bad is- Perceived good and bad, perceived good and bad. Things that move this way or that way. Neg- negative energy, positive energy, but it's all still just energy. It's all still just consciousness. The good and the bad is all created by consciousness. There's no good and bad separate from consciousness. It's all consciousness. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this up, but I wanna play one more clip for you because it's a case that you are very, have been very involved in and are very knowledgeable of, and it's the Chris Bledsoe story. Richard Dolan did an excellent series of interviews with Chris. Here is a clip from that. And the church don't want to believe it. They think it's demonic. The Mupan and the UFO world rejected it because of uh, these individuals that were controlling the thing. And here I'm stuck. And I've got these entities telling me, you got to tell your story. You got to tell your story. Tell what you know. And I told Mupan, I believe they were angels. I'll just put it right out there. And to today, I'm pretty sure that's what we're experiencing. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Okay. So there it is. So Grant, tell us, because you have a, a history of being with Chris. You guys have a friendship. You are a researcher of that case. Give people a little background, who he is, and then your interpretation of what he's saying. Okay, Chris ha- was a big-time business guy in Cal- in North Carolina. Had his experience in 2007, sort of an awakening experience. Him and four other people, including his son, he sort of falls off the edge of the earth. He's very depressed. His wife tells him, "You're not going to talk about this to me. You're not talking to the kids about it." He's in a Southern Baptist Pentecostal area. He says basically nobody that he works for will ever talk to him. He, his in-laws have nothing to do with him. And he basically sits for nine months in a room and basically prays to God to take him away that I I can't take this. And, and then he has an experience with what he called, what he, I think he calls the the lady in light. I call her the shining lady has like an angelic type experience on almost exactly the same day when I have my download experience in 2012, he has this encounter with this shining lady 
And so he interprets his experience based upon uh, biblical stuff, which I would tend to agree. And he basically is pointing out the fact that he believes it's a positive uh, phenomena. It's, he's, he's relating it back to a religious interpretation based upon this woman that it's angelic. But he's basically seeing it as a, as a positive experience. And there was some, some weird things that happened with him and me, with this dog, bizarre thing with the dog bleeding and stuff like that. So some of the stuff could be interpreted as kind of negative stuff, but he basically looks at it as an angelic experience, and he's here like a messiah to deliver a message to the world. Let's add a couple other interesting points here. One, and you covered this, but you kind of went over it quickly. Chris's experience has multiple witnesses. He didn't just experience this once, and he didn't just experience this all by himself. So that's significant. He's invited a number of very respectable researchers, including yourself, to investigate this with him, and they've all kind of come to the same conclusion. This is an outstanding case in terms of evidential value. He's a guy that we would call like a a high-level contactee, and so what has happened is he has been contacted by a whole series of people trying to find out, why have you got this contact? Who are you talking to? And these include people like Jim Semivan, who was a top uh, guy inside the CIA, I think ran covert ops for two years. And Jim Semivan had the beings in his room as well. And so he went to Chris to try to find out, you know, who is he dealing with? What's going on here? And he's had even, he showed me at one point to show you how, how high level these people may be who are trying to tap into Chris to figure it out. Because that's what ha- that's my impression is the government may have crashes material, they may have bodies, but they have no idea what's going on because it's got to do with consciousness. It's way above their pay grade. And so he showed me at one point a medal that um, he had gotten. And I said to him, I said, well, what's this medal? Where'd you get this uh, medallion from? And he said, I can't tell you. I can just tell you where it came from. And he flips the screen on his cell phone and it's a, it's a mailing envelope from Camp David. And then he shows me, he, he talks about healing people And you'll see that with the UFO experiences, 50% of all experiencers claim that they were healed or that they can heal other people. Chris is by far and away one of the best sort of known healers. There was people sending him clothes and and he became sort of very famous for this ability to heal. And he has has almost constant contact. You can go to his place and he will call them in and they will appear. And that's why the government and the military and all these people have so much interest in him is they're trying to figure out What's different with this guy? How is he able to make contact? And who is he actually dealing with? What are your answers to that question? Because in some ways, that does seem to fly in the face of your, it's only about separation kind of thing. We now have all these different actors and players involved. And you're kind of saying good and evil and angels and healing and all that stuff. And then we can also, and Chris's story also includes the kind of nefarious not so nice. I mean, he really gets raked over the coals by MUFON. He, it's a highly deceptive practice that they use to try and discredit him. There's some other players involved here that are clearly opposing what he's doing. So you can make of that what you may, but that's the part of the story as well. Well, all the human figures are in separation. So whatever their thing is, their MUFON is into getting technology there into he's a bad guy he failed a lie detector test the government is into same thing these could be evil aliens they could be here to uh, eat us or whatever and so they're looking and everybody's playing their own little thing based upon separation but it it comes down to what did he experience and his experience was a a positive experience he believed that these these beings are here to help him and I, i basically will say that his interpretation of what he sees will be based upon his manifestation. So because he has a religious background, he's going to see it in terms of a, a religious figure. It doesn't mean that it's not true, but he is picking up out of the field. He's been able to get in the field. One of the better to be able to bypass the noise in the left brain, get into the field, and he has a, a positive view of it. But the people outside him, whether it's the government or whether it's MUFON or people he knows, everybody's doing their own little thing. Like the, the same as the church, they had separation. I mean, he's dealing with the devil and he got, he was a, he was a deacon in the Pentecostal church and they threw him out because you're dealing with the devil. You are on the other side and this is good versus bad. And what about the people he's healing, Grant? Are they in separation? 
well, sure, they're in separation. Everybody's in separation. But the people come for... How is that even a meaningful term anymore, Grant, when you're, when on one hand, you seem to be making a distinction about how these uh, evil uh, Pentecostals threw them out because they thought it was all satanic in their narrow, narrow okay. definition of the Bible. But he has other people that he's that he's healing and he's doing good. I mean, you you do well, realize you can, you're kind of saying both all over the, but, all over well, the place. Well, just because a person gets healed doesn't mean they're a good person or a bad person. They're just a person. They get healed. If the you healing go to process, the healing process. Okay, the, okay so you look at the healing process. Thing. The Cadillac of all healing processes is the Bankston healing method. Bankston runs the, the Academy of Scientific Exploration. I went to Chicago to be trained on this healing thing. And what Bankston says is they do this rapid image cycling, which UFO experiencers report as well. It was reported at, in a 1994 school case where they see these images. And what Bankston teaches you to do is to flip these ego images in your brain. You get 20 of them, you flip them, and you, they teach you how to flip these things at 1,000 or 2,000 a second. And they teach it. And what it does is it shuts the left brain down. Because the ego, this is how it works. Listen, you're laughing, but this is how it works. Bankston says, nobody is doing the healing. With this process, what it is is to get the healer out of the way. And once the ego, the healer gets out of the way, the left brain gets shut down, then the, 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 the energy flows and the healing takes place. But it has nothing to do with people are good people or bad people. There are methods of healing. And it has to do with, some people can do it, and it has to do with getting the healer out of the way and allowing the energy to come through. Uh, I, d d d d d yeah, we, keep, we keep going round and round. And yeah, but I, I, don't see what you're, I don't see what you're trying to get at. I mean, you know, like, so, you know, because he heals somebody, then there's a bad guy and there's a good guy. And it's just, it's like crazy stuff. I mean, it's like we're into this thing where- Grant, that's how we're, what you keep saying. You keep you keep your story suggests that there there's an element of good to some of these things, and your 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 story also, Here's, and then and then you have this like thing built in where as soon as you say that, then when I point out that you're kind of saying, hey, he had, he sees it as an angelic experience, he sees it as a positive experience. That's his report that there is good and that he should move towards the light and all this. Then it's like, well, that's just his interpretation. It is. It's use, all of interpretation. And well, it, it, everything, everything is everybody's interpretation. Exactly. But what no, you, like you were quoting me, uh, Ray's survey, right? And yeah. you made a big deal out of only 9% thought it was evil. That doesn't mean anything based on what you're saying. If you want to go with stats, then we, we, then let's look at the stats and let's look at Jeff Long's stats. And he says that like in the 90% that people believe from their experience, directly from experience, that there is God as we would understand it. There's a hierarchy of consciousness. There is a moral imperative. That's a 90 percenter, Grant. So you can say you don't believe in that. That's just separation. You can just shut me down. But that's the data we have. So you can just say, well, that data, I don't care. by consciousness. There's no separate, there's no, nothing separate from consciousness. When you the get data, into the, the data suggests otherwise, the data suggests when, otherwise. When, I just gave you the data. out of body experience, you have moved into a contact modality, the same as you do with healing that you've gotten into the you, field. You, you and, but you can that. create. You don't, you, you don't know that. We're just looking. Why were you comfortable? Why were you comfortable reporting Ray's data? And you want to shout me down when I report you Jeff Long's because, because, experience data. Because the modern view of UFOs is they're evil aliens. And when you actually talk to the experiences, which is what I say you have to do, you've got to talk to the people who are interacting with the phenomena and listen to what they're saying. And that when you look at the data, the idea that there are evil aliens is total nonsense. We're not arguing that. We're arguing whether there is anything at all like evil. Do you see there's a difference between saying what percentage of the aliens are evil and saying, is there such a thing as evil? And what there is I'm such reporting, a thing as, what there I'm is reporting to you, what I'm reporting to you, and you haven't really directly responded to, is Jeff Long, data, most recent, best-selling, New York Times best-selling book. He's a guy who's just following the data. He says, hierarchy of consciousness, yes. God, yes. Moral imperative, yes. At a super high percentage, like 90%. So how do you counter that data other than just to say, no, no, no? I don't say no, no, no. I say that when you go into an out-of-body experience and you have your, your, your situation or you, you have the, the life review it, when you die in the Newton work, which is 35,000 regressions, 
then it's basically the, the fact that people judge themselves and they realize I could have done this better. I could have done that better. And, but all still comes down to the belief in separation that you, when you believe that you're separate, then you, you make these, these, Jeff Long these doesn't say that that's not Jeff Long's finding. Uh, Jeff Long's finding doesn't contradict that directly, but that is not his finding. His finding is God as we would, and that's an uncomfortable word, but it's the best kind of colloquial phrase we can use. They come back and report a, hierarchy of consciousness, beings that they understand at the time to be, if you will, somewhat further on the path, somewhat higher. That's the finding, Grant. So you can sweep that under the rug and say I, it's irrelevant, I, but that's I don't the disagree. finding. I don't disagree. That's the Newton thing. The Newton thing has you just have the different levels of, of beings that have, based upon their knowledge of, of separation and, under, and, and, and oneness, and that it goes by color. So it's the white color, and it goes up to yellow, and then it goes to blue, and then it goes to, to mauve, the colors of the, the higher spiritual beings. Yes, that's all true, but it doesn't mean that there are, that, that they same came out of somewhere. They all went through the same process, that you and I will go through that process, and we can elevate ourselves in the spiritual world, but it's all done by one thing, separation and oneness, that if you do separation, you're going to move down the scale. And if you do oneness, you're going to move up the scale and you're going to move towards. And the, the idea of God is just a noun. It's all consciousness. There is only one thing. Call it whatever you want. It is consciousness. I, I just disagree with this names and this is good and bad and these and that. And it's, it's all manifestations. And you see that in, in the near-death experiences. You see that in, especially in lucid dreaming, where you can actually change the scene in the lucid dream. And, the, the, and I go back to where I started is when you do, if you're, you're going to refer to uh, near-death experiences, you take the near-death experience and you do the oneness, you put it in a Google search, that girl's video will come up and she says her impression based upon her experience was there are no victims, there are just volunteers. And I have talked to people who have had that and I've questioned them at length. I, are you sure that's what we were told? And that's what happened. You mentioned this girl in, in, the, in the, the whole deal with... Um, Martini's video when she's in the in the death camp she says I volunteered for that and 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 Martini looks over the camera and he says that is the most inappropriate thing I've ever heard and that's the whole idea is it random or are is this just a big play where we come in and you kill me this time and I kill you that really gets into Newton stuff which is really out on the edge that people really can't accept the fact that there are no there are no victims. We like to be Jesus. We like to get up on the cross and say, "Oh, we're being persecuted," and "My God, everybody's against this and stuff." And 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 basically, we got to get off the cross. They need the wood. I mean, this idea that we are victims. Once you take responsibility, whatever is happening, if you take responsibility for the fact that you may have encountered, you may have brought these things into your life, you will you will start to advance. As long as you think you're a victim and that you're being abducted or the government's after you or whatever, you are never going to resolve anything. You have to take responsibility for the fact that maybe I put these things in my way. I put these stones in my path and that everything that happens to me is going to happen for a reason. Because what you basically is happening is we're, we're playing a game where we're sitting at the poker table and the de they're dealing us the cards and we can't take responsibility that we got to play the cards we're dealt. We just sit there and we whine and complain and we want the dealer to keep changing the deck. Don't deal me bad cards, just deal me good cards. We have to play the cards we're dealt. And I say personal responsibility. I, whatever happened to me, I agree that I put that in my path, that I agreed to it and I'm going to play it the best way I can. I almost feel like this is a good place to end it. There's so many points to that that I agree with. I just can't get through to you on the points that I guess I, I mean, we're just slicing the same stuff a bunch of different ways. I don't disagree with uh, personal responsibility, but you know, all those colors that you mentioned, see, I will, I can't, I can't resist. All those <laughs> colors you mentioned, colors are nouns. Right, so it's the white and the blue, but it's the description. So people will describe what they think they're seeing, but, but it's a great grant. Back. You can't have it, both it's all ways. screen image, Alex. It's you, all screen image. Let me give you an example. Last, last example. No, no, you can't, no. you can't have it, but uh, you can give me all the cases, and I can we don't, I, we don't disagree on the cases. It's I'm all screen saying. image, there's no physical. This is not physical. It's all screen image. When my father, give you an example, my father was a very sort of skeptical type guy. Two days before he dies, his father comes to see him. 
Now, was it his father that came to see him? Because his father would have lived a thousand different lives. And if it was his father, why did he come as, his, as my grandfather? Because if he had come as anything else, he wouldn't, my father wouldn't have known who he was. It wouldn't have meant anything. He screen imaged. He came across. And I'll give you another example. Sherry Wilde, I don't know if you've interviewed her. She goes on board the ship, and she says, she says at 15 years old, she's on board the ship, and they bring out Albert Einstein, Albert Schweitzer, and they bring out Tesla, and they bring out a bunch of famous people. And, of course, I said to her, I said, okay, you saw these people? You talked to them? And I said, okay, were they physical? Were they physical human? And she says, I know exactly where you're going with it, and I'll tell you what. It may have been a, it may have been a hologram, but they sure look real to me. So that's the question. Did Albert Einstein actually come back into the physical body and come on a ship? Or is this it's all screen imaging? It's all ooly stuff. In the, and you learn that in, the, in the, the lucid dream stuff. When you go in there and you can actually change the characters. You can actually move things around. And the lucid dream people will say it's more real than the real world, which means this is the dream. I know. I've heard all that stuff, too. But I've also heard of physical manifestations of people that are as real as you and me. So there's all sorts of different... Are the actual beings then, or are they yes. just is it well, called screen image? Well, screen image is a very kind of touchy kind of phrase, especially when we get into this idea that it's all consciousness, that in somehow we're co-creators of a reality. That there's an you know we started this, we never even got into it. You know, I interviewed. Do you know Riz Verk? He has a book called The Simulation Hypothesis. Yep. Brilliant guy, MIT, compute computer game lab. So he's like a super duper gaming guy and right done really, you know him right? yeah i so, i know the it's an you, important idea the idea of the of the and that's where we're going so when i started in 2012 this was this was not really talked about but now we're talking simulation hypotheses we talk about the experiments that was done with the kids that played the gaming thing where they're in the dream and suddenly they're being chased by an evil whatever and they go oh fantastic and they turn around and they they shoot them they think this is great and it's all it's it all goes to the thing that we're now starting to learn it may all be just a giant hologram, a giant simulation. It's all just a, a game. Simulation of what? How do you deal with the infinite regress? The infinite regress is when people say it's a simulation, it's a simulation of what? What is it simulating? Is there some other no. reality that it's simulating? And is that reality? Oh, I'm not backing the simulation. I'm just saying that we're moving more that's to the idea. That's what you just said. You said it's a simulation. No, I'm saying it's the, that's the term that's being used now, and we're getting closer to the idea that it's all just ooly stuff. It's all just an illusion. It's just it's like the the, the Maya stuff. It's it's not really I physical. That. I get that. It is Maya, and we've been talking about that forever. But then why do you tell these stories? Why do I tell these stories? Because they're meaningful to us in some way in terms of navigating – our experience exactly so you agree. can't just trounce all over everybody but you have to realize it's different... a story alex you well, can't but make you, it as physical you don't game. know you don't know if your stories and your interpretation of it are more valid than somebody else's interpretation of it and and to redu to to keep insisting that you will arbitrarily at your given moment reduce flatten everything down to it's all consciousness and therefore it's all separation that loses its meaning it takes the meaning out of uh, out of a lot of these stories so uh, I, I, just I just put it out there as a theory which is now starting to be validated you can even go back to the quantum physics nothing gets behind consciousness all these quantum physics guys seem to realize that back in the day that consciousness, it, or John Wheeler, it's a participatory universe. We're starting to realize this is going to be the case. It may not be right, but more and more as I go along, there's more and more evidence that validates that theory, that it's just all a big illusion. It's all just a big thing. There is no physical. There are no nouns. It's just us manifesting from the one. We are all the one. Final question. You just used the word us. One of the problems I have with a lot of people who spin this stuff out there is invariably our human consciousness works its way into the center of the story. We kind of have this tendency to be kind of egocentric about things and it's about our consciousness and how we manifest and we bring these things into existence. Doesn't that seem a little bit misplaced in terms of that we have some special role to play in this and that our consciousness is somehow special in some way what do you think let me go back to joe bolte taylor she said that when she had the left brain hemorrhage 
And when her left brain went offline, she realized I am not an individual. That is an illusion. I am one with the universe. There is just one. Yeah. Okay, keep going. But you keep using the term us. Do you believe well, I'll make it a, a real specific question. Do you believe that our manifestation of consciousness is somehow special, unique, different than let's say, let's hypothesize about two other beings. Let's hypothesize about an ET, a okay. visitor of a physical, biological visitor from another planet. One of the questions I always pose to people is, what do you think ET sees in its life review? So my question is, the consciousness experience that ET is manifesting, how is that different, similar, better, worse than ours? And then the other example I'd say is a spirit entity. We have after-death communication, yep. people are okay. connecting with spirits. Same question for that. What is their experience in terms of manifesting conscious? And you can't just right. say, it's all one, it's all the same, there's no separation, it's all just one. Because there's three right. different things there. There's me, there's ET, and there's a spirit. There, there's no nouns, there's just one thing. So you have ETs that are masquerading as ETs, you have spirit guides that are masquerading as, they're, they're in, they, they have, they're one with us. There's no separation, they're one with us, they're higher, they're higher, Beings that have separated, we've all separated. We come across the river of forgetfulness, and when you talk about the 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 beings, I believe they're higher understanding. They understand oneness. That's the number one message that's given to experiencers. You cannot get off the planet unless you understand its oneness. That was the question that was asked by Jan Hartson to Ben Rich from Lockheed Skunk Works. He said, "How do they get here? How does it work?" And Ben Rich said, "What do you know about ESP?" And he said. It means everything in time and space is connected. He said, that's how it works. There is no time. There is no space. There is no physical universe. It's all one thing. And when you realize you're going to get off the planet, as long as you believe there's separation and there's them and us, you, we, we aren't going anywhere. So it's all the same thing. It's just a different a different element. It's just a different uh, spirits. And that's why I'm writing the book, E.T. or maybe not. And why I look at are you? Why are you writing the book? If it's all the same, it's all Because I used thing. to believe that there was actual E.T.s that were coming from other planets. And, and the more you look at it, you more go, no, this looks like spirits. This looks like... Uh, not to me. No, it looks like E.T.s from other planets and spirits and shamanic journeying and all that other stuff. And they all came out of the one. They all came out of the one. They decided well, I'm going to be. That's fine, but why are you writing the book? Why are you writing the book? Because, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying just going to say the, I'm going to say it's all it's all one. Uh, Grant Grant has all the contact modalities, but it's all one. It's it all is. about consciousness. All it those the, all those reports are a waste of time. All the no, stories are a waste, waste of, of time. time. They're not a waste. It's of all time. one. It's all one. It's all it, one. All, it's all, all consciousness. This, all the material leads us back to the fact that it's all one thing. That they yeah, that well, you got that. I got that at the beginning. It's all so one. Many, Why talk example, about it? Why talk about example, it? It's all one. It's all one. If you look at the free survey, there's so many people say I was an alien last time. There's a bunch of people. John Denver believed he was an alien. He Why believed look he came at from that? The Why look at any of that? It's all one. It doesn't matter. John right. John Denver's so you're like gonna, experience. So you're going to come matter. back. As, you come back as an alien next time. You come back doesn't as a pedophile. Matter. You come back doesn't as a matter. It's all one. It's all one. It's all consciousness. It doesn't matter. Everything you say, it doesn't matter. It's well, it all doesn't matter. I don't it's say it doesn't one. matter. I don't say it doesn't matter. I just say it's all one. You're the one that's putting the nouns and saying this matters. This is important. This is. It's not. Well, how it's does it matter? How does it matter then, Grant? How does it matter? How does it matter? Because I have a path that I have to take, and I'm trying to figure out what's the path I'm supposed to take and what I'm supposed to do. And it comes down to there is no time, there is no space. Live in the moment. Live. Live. How could live. what you do? How could what you do possibly matter? It's all one. It, it's all one. Yeah, but you. You. How could what you do possibly matter? How can doing anything make a difference? Because it will influence other people. Other people will say, oh, I understand that. Uh, so, so other people do something different. How does that make a difference? It's a, it's a learning. The whole, the whole life what do you is mean learning? learning. There's no learning. You just, you come in, you're the Are pedophile you this me in time. The, in, you come in, in you're the pedophile experience? this time. You're the evil alien next time. You're gonna learn it doesn't something. make any difference. What, what do you mean learn? What do you mean learn? You're, you you're need progressing to learn understanding and empathy. You're pro oh, oh, so our understanding and empathy good? Absolutely. Because you're good. what you're saying, you're saying okay. Understanding that and empathy are good. Something is good. We want to move towards something that's good, right? Exactly. Exactly. I agree. 
So you, you, it's a process of learning, of me understanding how does this work and what's my role. And then when I saw Michael Newton and I saw that, he influenced me. I realized like, oh, this makes sense, that there is this, this, this path and that you take responsibility for your stuff, you live in the present moment, and you live, you live for others rather than for self. And that's basically what, what I come down to, and I take personal responsibility. I don't try to blame the Russians or the Jews or the hold anybody. On, hold on, hold on, that, because you realize this kind of goes against what you were saying earlier, but that's okay. I get it, because I think that's where your heart really is at, and that's where my heart is at, is we have to try and do we have to try and do the right thing. There is a moral imperative. There is a reality to, to goodness, Absolutely. To righteousness. And there's, and there's the opposite of that too. So we should resist it, it, with our choice, with our consciousness, we should resist doing things that move us away from that. So that's I all agree. I was trying to say from the beginning. Okay, I agree with you. But when it comes to other people, you have to have e empathy. That was, that was the lesson that was turned to me about homeless. I was at 500 person only shelter and the first lesson they teach you is take a look around nobody planned to be here but we say oh they're bad guys why don't they just go and stop drinking and get a job and we don't have the empathy we don't have the understanding that there but for the grace of god go i and that if i was in their shoes and walked around then maybe i'd understand maybe why they're doing what they're doing that's all i'm saying i totally get that on one level and on another level you know political debates i think i think in a lot of ways and this is part of the problem with this ongoing dialogue that we're having. Political debates divide us in a way that really does create the separation, to use your words. Because to suggest that, you know, one political point of view or one economic point of view is inherently better than another, I, I think we have just too many examples where it's really I'll just go back to what you said. It's in our heart already to know what is right. It's not that complicated. And we should try and do what's right. And it probably will wind up being a pretty good decision to make in the grand scheme of things. That's do what thou wilt. Not a I agree. very good strategy. I agree. Not a but very let good me make, strategy. Let me make one final point on oneness. You are the United States of America. The most powerful country in the world because it's the united states of america and you now have separation you have half the people believe one thing half the people believe the other thing and there's actually people posting friends of mine went and posted and said we should actually take these people up and line them up and shoot them so now you have a separation uh, understanding where it's one american versus another american and when you get separation you're going to get division you're going to get killing and it's going to go downhill as the united states of america was the most powerful country and they liked to the world because they believed they were one they were all the same all created under god when? what point in history are you pointing to because the more i read about and study my american history the more i i, I don't see this golden era that you're talking about well, the, the fact that you had a situation where you, in Congress you could actually pass a bill, that in the House you've got 250 bills that don't even pass, that you have this total when, division. What period, where, what period are you talking about? In the last year where you can put no, whatever no, you want. No, no, no. What period in the past are you talking about where there was this golden age where democracy and freedom reigned and there wasn't corruption? And, and Well, there's always going to be corruption, but 20 years ago you could actually pass a bill. Now you can't even pass a bill. It's totally divided. Ago. So 20 years ago? And, so and tw was there 20 years ago where people were saying, we, there's 50%, we're saying we should kill the other 50%, we should get, you know, this kind of stuff. This is new. Once you get 9 separation. 9-11 was an orchestrated event that was designed to destroy the Fourth Amendment, which it did. It's never been restored. A lot of people think it was also designed to kind of cramp down on the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, which it seems to be heading in that direction. That's what happened 20 years ago. So 20 years ago is a, is a glory day? That is separation again. That is a bunch of people decided. No, you said 20 years ago. So pick no, a but different I'm, I'm not date. saying pick it was perfect. I've, at pick no time, a different Alex, date. At no time am I saying it's perfect. I'm saying it is better before than it is now. Because at no point did you have a situation where somebody can stand up and make a speech and 50% and of people will see one speech and the other 50% of people will see completely different viewpoint it is completely divided and the more it divides the more you're going to get into a situation where you're going to have civil war and you're going to have americans fighting americans if you were 
playing the chessboard and don't you dare use separation in your answer to this. <laughs> if you were you if you were playing the chessboard and you were to win? trying to, to win, right? Because you thought winning and you thought winning meant control in the herd, then might you not see an advantage in divisiveness? Might you sure. not see an advantage Absolutely. in fear sells? Uh, like this lecture is not going to sell. Fear right. sells. It makes money. We clean the stock market every 12 years. The, the big guys go take the money off the board and then buy stuff back at 30% on the dollar. Yeah, separation and, and division sell. It makes lots of money. I will agree with that. And I would say that it's not really about the, I mean, ultimately it can be about the money, but it's also about the, the herd. It's about the control. And sure. it, when people are afraid, when people feel isolated, when people yeah. feel, I'll use the word separation, they are much easier to control. I mean, yeah, and, I don't and the people that are doing the controlling believe in separation. They believe that I am here and you are just an object that I am going to use. Whether you're a child, whether you're a person's money, whatever, I am the guy, you are just an object. When you suddenly realize that the people that you are taking their money are doing whatever you're doing to them, when you realize that is me, that's when you suddenly realize that you've got to stop doing it because we are all the same person. As long as we I believe agree that with you. I agree with you. I just don't think that that maps quite as directly onto the political process as you do. The notion that there is a political solution to this or that there's a group that's a party that's somehow no, there isn't. separate from that. No, there isn't uh, because they're all doing the ego thing. They're saying, I, there's a problem and I'm the Messiah who's going to save the thing. That's not how it works. It's got nothing to do with politics. It's just another division game. Well, I, I think the Jeffrey Epstein case has so much more to say to this. And if you really look at brownstoning and sexual blackmail, and you know, you really start tracing it back and you go, oh, wow, Roy Cohen. Oh, wow, back in the 80s. Oh, wow, there it pops up back in the 60s. Oh, I just listened to a guy who wrote an excellent book about Watergate. That's ultimately what Watergate was about. A madam, another DC madam who had a little black book and was sexually black men. This is an ongoing game. I just interviewed uh, John Brisson about the finders cult. If no one's ever heard about that again, if you're in, if you're in intelligence, if you're in, in one of the alphabet letter intelligence organizations and you have are tasked with kind of infiltrating and winning against some foreign government, yep. well, you can do a bunch of other stuff, but when somebody goes, you know, that guy's into eight-year-old boys and I can procure for you sure. an eight-year-old boy and get him in this hotel room. We can videotape the whole thing and we got that motherfucker. We got him for life. Now, even if you're a stand-up guy in the CIA, that is super duper tempting because you're like, you know, we've been trying to crack the code with Egypt for 20 years and we can't do it. But if I just do this one evil deed and if I just further destroy the life of this eight-year-old boy, I can, in this, you know, balancing act, I can accomplish all these good things against these people kind of thing. So I, I just, I don't have the same lens that you do on politics. I think politics is always a dirty win at all cost game. And I think the only way out is to be completely out of it and to be completely apolitical. And I think it comes down to compassion. All the things that you care about, I care about. We both resonated with the Dalai Lama story of the monk who comes back and says, I almost lost it all. I almost lost the ability to see my worst enemy as just another part of me, which is what you've been saying all along. Yeah. And, and so when it gets to political or sexual thing, it's, it always comes down to this person is separate from me. They are an object. I need to use this object in order to benefit me, or I think I'm going to do something good by doing this. Once you see a person or a thing as an object, it is there to be used and to be benefited by, and you really lose the idea that everything is conscious, everything is sentient, everything is God. And once, once you realize that, you stop doing all this crazy stuff to things that we believe are just objects. It's just an object, it's just a person, it's just a, a, a bad guy from another country, it's just an oppressor or whatever. 
Once you can make that separation, then you can do all manner of evil. Our guest again has been the ever so magnificent Grant Cameron. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation, the give and take, uh, which you can only get into with people that you really respect at this level and you admire this level. Grant, in the time that we have left, please tell people how to stay in touch with your work and what's coming up. When are these books coming out? Apparently, you said the Contact Modality book is coming out right now. What about the Aport book? We didn't talk about any of yeah, that. The When's that book. out? I've got about maybe six books that are sort of in editing. I, I'm not really into that part of the thing. I'm more into the discovery. So I'm now into physical mediums, people who are able to bring uh, Louis Armstrong into a room and uh, play and uh, produce uh, ports and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm still the research guy. Most of my stuff will be on my White House UFO YouTube channel, where I put a lot of interviews that I do with people who I think have an interesting story to tell that sort of that goes into this kind of stuff. I'm doing a book on Mount Shasta, which is an experience when I was at Mount Shasta, where they had this being appear there. The Mission Rama people, if you know that whole story, I was there when this happened. I documented the whole weekend in a book. And the Apport book is, is extremely important, the manifestation in Apport. But again, they're all lined up. And if they get published, they get published. If they don't, they don't. I'm really not that concerned. I'm more interested in chasing down what I think are very interesting people who have stories. And my main thing now is the link between the spiritual world and the UFO world, which is going to be detailed in this book, Extraterrestrial or Maybe Not. I look at the all the problems with the extraterrestrial theory. You know, when I hear you talk like this, I, I wonder how we even manage to disagree on everything. I'm so in line with all your fabulous work and everything that you're doing. And ultimately, we are of the same heart. On oh, the yeah. Reports. We've had some good discussions. And I think this discussion will help. I think this is what people need to hear, even though it may sound a little controversial. Ten years from now, I don't think it'll be as controversial as it is now, because people are just starting to get into this. And you and I, and I say this to the people in the UFO community, I have a, a new assistant, uh, Sinead Wellahan, who's joined me. And she just had her awakening about six, eight months ago. And I keep telling her, Sinead, you got to realize there are only a couple of people who know what, when you talk about consciousness, you may have people in the UFO community who use the word. They have no idea. It's only at your level and my level that people actually understand the connection to the uh, near-death experience, to the spirit world, to all this kind of stuff. Very few people understand the consciousness angle. And I keep warning her. I say, you got to realize there's not that many people. And we are the first people who are on the, the front line of this thing. So 10 years from now, I think you and I, the conversations we've had, will mean a lot more to people. They will suddenly catch on that this is an important aspect. Right now, everybody's still into, you know, where are the aliens from? What's the technology? You know, we're going to get the free energy. And they're into that whole nuts and bolts thing. You and I are one of the few people, I think, that are on the leading edge of this consciousness thing, which I believe is going to answer all the questions. Grant, awesome having you on. Thanks again. Beautiful. Thank you, Alex. Thanks so much to Grant Cameron for joining me today on Skeptico. As I said during the interview, you know, there's a lot of heated exchanges between Grant and I, but that's mainly because he's a guy I can get to level three with on this discussion. And I want to get to level three with you. So let me throw out a question. It's the, the question I always tease with, and that's what does ET see in its life review? And the reason I like that question is it kind of immediately catapults us into all these important questions about the moral imperative. Is there good? Is there bad? Are we obligated to try and do something for some reason? And it also obviously brings into focus these extended consciousness realms and these beings, whether they be spirit beings, ET beings, or no beings at all, if you're a completely materialist atheist, that might exist in these extended consciousness realms. So let me know your thoughts to that kind of question that I kind of dragged down there. And the place to do it, of course, is the Skeptical Forum. Please join me over there. You know, I've said this before, but I'll repeat it. One of the real pleasures I get out of this show is interacting with you, you folks who listen to it and have so many fantastic ideas. I've gained so much from people who share with me new information, things that they're learning, things that they're experiencing. That's so, so much a part of this whole experience for me. And I've just found that the Skeptical Forum is kind of a good place to do that. So if you haven't been over there in a while, 
Come back, see what's going on, be part of that community, join us, talk to us, and uh, let's get that dialogue going. And of course, while your fingers are typing, be sure to check out skeptico.com where you can download all these shows for free or just grab the link and share it with share it with someone who you think needs to hear this information. I kind of have this idea that the right person finds a way to share this show with the right person who needs it at the time that they need it. That's that's my fantasy that that I play in my head. So see if that works for you. I do have a number of great shows, I think, coming up. Please stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now. Mm-hmm.